Does sound pretty familiar. On the other hand, my opinions are always worth listening to, so you'll 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 have that. Okay. So, um, for treatment providers. First of all, congratulations on finding the time to get here. I know how hard that is. I hope you're enjoying your lunch, lunches. Um, so how are we entwined with research as, treat as treatment providers? Well, we want to offer the best quality treatment and outcome research gives us a chance to find out what that is, what works, for whom, um, because our clients vary enormously, we need to know who works, uh, what works for whom. Are there new modalities that might work better? Could we provide treatment with more, more cost effectively? Um, and since training resources are limited, what modalities should we be focusing on when we, when we go to training? How do we know we're being effective? And I think that's a really crucial point. Um, how do we measure outcomes so that we can improve what we are offering? For researchers, um, I've spent a lot of time talking to and arguing with uh, researchers who have their own lines, their own research lines, their own interests, and their own constraints to deal with, obviously. Um, however, developing your research questions in close connection with a cl uh, clinician uh, and a clinical program means that, first of all, you get some great questions to address because clinicians have really great questions um, that they're grappling with every day on, on how to, how to uh, improve treatment and make people better. Um, questions arising out of clinical work are going to be highly relevant to real people and real people suffering. Um, so your work is more likely to be applied and directly beneficial. And of course, you get client data, which is always a prize. So just to go on to, um, to what kinds of, of data and results there are out there, as most of us know, cognitive behavioral therapy is a modality that is best researched in this field. Uh, there are several, there's so much research that there are in fact several meta-analyses of CBT studies. Um, CBT is a present-oriented intervention focused on teaching clients skills to modify maladaptive thinking and behavior. Components might include uh, addressing of cognitive distortions about gambling, like as in cognitive restructuring, for instance, examining gambling myths, gambling beliefs, etc. It could include a functional analysis of gambling behavior. What, what is the gambling giving the client? And uh, um, because there are positive effects as well as negative, and how maybe that could be replaced. Identifying and managing triggers. Enhancing interpersonal skills, because those uh, may be uh, an issue that is leading to gambling behavior. Uh, developing alternate activities to gambling. And longer term planning to avoid relapse. Um, exposure therapy and desensitization is another CBT uh, intervention, uh, 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 allowing people uh, some exposure to uh, the kinds of uh, triggering events that, that uh, they have and teaching them um, to relax during those and, and become desensitized to them. Now, some of the studies that uh, are, are in the, the literature use treatment as usual, in other words, what is offered in, in treatment programs in a flexible form, but not very many. Most studies, probably the vast majority, are more time limited, limited and stripped down protocols. They're very specific protocols with limitations on what's offered and how much time it's offered uh, for. Um, but the studies and meta-analyses certainly make it clear that CDT does significantly reduce gambling behavior. Uh, in terms of how frequent uh, the behavior occurs and frequently and uh, how much money is spent. Uh, and uh, the effects do persist in follow-up. So these things, uh, the effects last. Uh, what's generally found is that um, the different focuses of CBT, the different approaches within CBT are equally effective. For instance, uh, Tolchard in 2016 examined 27 different studies in order to compare cognitive versus behavioral interventions um, and found no difference in outcome. Uh, 
So what I wonder is, is it possible to, um, uh, is it possible that content matters less than the fact that the client is engaged? Uh, or does it have to do with client characteristics? Uh, we know that relationships and the alliance, relationship with the uh, uh, clinician and the alliance are a huge part of whether a client succeeds. And the group support that clients receive, we assume, is also important. They say it is. Um, you know, is that the issue? Is that what, what helps people as opposed to the specific content of the treatment? Also, when people show up for therapy, that's a self-statement uh, that they want to change. And that in itself may be a fairly major factor, even in brief treatment. So content may not be crucial. One of the issues that, uh, and w one of the other questions I have is uh, who drops out and why? Uh, dropouts are not well studied. That's not surprising because dropouts are hard to reach, uh, but they're important. Why do we lose those clients? What would keep them in treatment? We, you know, this is something that, that is important for us to know. So going on to brief treatment, and of course there are overlaps with CBT, you know, there, there are different sort of versions of these various uh, modalities. So brief treatment is an advantage uh, when resources are limited, when clients are unwilling to commit to more, uh, to, to more intensive treatment or lengthier treatment. Um, I think also that brief treatments provide researchers with a, a usefully circumscribed intervention that is easy to script and deliver. I think that the prevalence of brief treatment research, and there's a lot of it, um, might have something to do with the ease with which it is, um, uh, with it, that it fits into a research protocol. Um, never easy, of course, but easier. Uh, than the kind of messy work that, that uh, longer-term studies, uh, longer-term treatment might, might represent. There are, are uh, many elements that have been tried in brief treatment, including motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing, for anybody who doesn't know, focuses on helping clients to explore and resolve ambivalence uh, in order to move them toward change. Um, other uh, modalities include self-help manuals, which is uh, providing materials such as worksheets and lesson plans for clients to complete at home. And these, this is often offered in combination with brief advice and phone support. Uh, another modality, again, is brief therapist support by phone or in person. And uh, personalized, normalized feedback is another common element of brief treatment. Um, it provides clients with uh, results and interpretations of some standardized assessment tools. And the particular focus, it would be on the areas in which the, the, their results are different from the norm. In other words, they're gambling a lot more than most people uh, there, you know, whatever that happens to be, that's one, one result. Um, and this is often a single session intervention. And many, many studies combine these interventions as well. So um, there, there are, as I said, many um, such studies. There are enough for uh, uh, reviews, which find uh, overall that clients receiving active treatment, active brief treatment, do significantly better than those in the control group, but also find that the active treatments frequently don't differ significantly from one another, or one study contradicts another. However, when there is a difference, it does tend to favor motivational interviewing. So that's a useful thing to know. Some of the unanswered questions that I have around the, these, um, uh, these studies are, do treatment services offer such interventions? Will they offer such interventions? Um, you know, in, 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 do community providers uh, do this, or is it only researchers? Um, by default, we know that pathway one clients are usually brief but we don't necessarily give them workbooks or brief advice. Um, so, you know, should we be targeting uh, um, the, the early stage problem gamblers with more uh, targeted specific interventions that are in fact brief um, and go along with these research studies? Uh, we also know and research confirms that treatment seeking is associated with problem severity. And we know this and then there's good research on this. Uh, people uh, show up for gambling treatment when they're desperate. 
uh, when they're really pushed and they're at the end of their rope. We do sometimes see people earlier, but it's not all that frequent. Studies, research studies, pay their participants. So one of my questions is, will early stage problem gamblers attend brief treatment if they're not paid? And I don't think we know that. If anybody does know that, that would be great. Um, okay. So online interventions. This is another area that is up and coming. Um, there's been a, a surge in recent trials. It's seen as an emerging and promising approach uh, by uh, Yakovenko and Hodgins um, and, uh, and those people I trust. Um, brief treatment uh, interventions offered online is basically what we're looking at. The, the advantage here is easy availability. Um, it can be uh, accessed from people's homes. It can be offered on gambling sites. And that's one of the uses that it's uh, being uh, experimented with um, on with. Uh, the gambling sites that have some ethical concerns about uh, problem gambling are looking at adding uh, gambling treatment. And so this is one area to explore. Um, and it's an opportunity for early intervention. My same, my same questions um, stand, but uh, it, it has a, some promise there. The, the results in the studies are positive in some, but not all. So uh, there, there are some promising uh, suggestions in the, in, the in the data, but uh, not universal. The dropout level is quite high in some studies. So there, again, is the question about motivation in people who are at an early stage. So we need to know what motivates early stage problem gamblers and which clients would benefit from online interventions. Uh, mindfulness. Mindfulness is intended to increase clients' awareness of their physical and mental and emotional state and accept those feelings without judgment. The goal being to learn greater control over thoughts and feelings rather than being controlled by them. Mindfulness has been increasingly well used, um, and in my experience, it's very well appreciated by clients and, and, uh, and, and used a lot. Um, its effectiveness has been well studied in a number of disorders, but not in problem gambling. There are a couple of studies, but there just hasn't been a lot um, in the way of actual outcome studies. Uh, however, uh, Tony, Tony, Tony Otto combines CBT and mindfulness and found significant improvement uh, compared with weightless controls, which is uh, not entirely surprising. Um, continued mindfulness practice was associated with significantly better clinical outcomes, and that's correlational, but it's a good sign. Uh, Macintosh, in 2016, compared the effectiveness of mindfulness-based treatment to two versions of CBT, um, and all three treatments led to large improvements, which persisted at follow-up. So, in other words, mindfulness is, is useful. Perhaps it's a good adjunct. Again, we don't know what works best for them. Family involvement. Now, I think this area is so important, I gave it three slides. Um, I think this is a really seriously understudied area. Gambling has serious impacts on families. Uh, we know that uh, from our own experience. Uh, Kirchen Takis did, did a literature review in 2013 um, that um, uh, in, in indicated uh, findings uh, such as that spouses and other family members experienced loss of trust, emotional distress, including fear, anger, loss of safety and security, guilt, despair, uncertainty. Uh, they experienced financial difficulties, marital satisfaction and dissatisfaction and conflict, stress, parenting problems, physical and mental health impacts, and isolation. Um, the negative effects on family and couple functioning were also um, confirmed. Children experienced a loss of safety and stability uh, and security through, um, through poor parenting, absent parenting, abusive parenting. Um, and the material impact of problem gambling affected their well-being. In other words, there wasn't much money, they had to move, they were, um, you know, they were affected in terms of 
what resources they had available to them. Children were more likely to suffer from depression symptoms and conduct problems. So as we know, it, you know, each gambler affects many others, and the family really does need help. The issues that I described continue long after the gambling stops. Just because somebody stops gambling does not mean that the family goes back to normal. Um, this is a huge complication for recovery. Uh, there is no safe haven, for instance, for the gambler when they go home. Uh, there's no safe place because people are still angry, um, people are still suffering. There, the roles and the, and the uh, uh, relationships are still distorted and conflicted. Um, and this is, this is really a complication uh, and prevents some people from recovering or, or slows it down or makes people quite vulnerable to relapse. Any kind of chronic conflict and mistrust is going to raise the risk of relapse. Also, the, the family has its own needs. Uh, if the, um, so the gambling recovery is hampered if the family isn't treated, and the family needs to be treated as a whole, not just as an adjunct to the gambling treatment. That's the, the argument I have with Kraft, um, is that it, it focuses on getting people into treatment rather than focusing on treating the whole family. Um, so this is a seriously understudied area. Um, the, uh, uh, we, we, there are just a few studies. Jimenez Murcia in 2016 found that family involvement was associated with higher treatment attendance, reduced dropout, lower rates of relapse, and better adherence to treatment guidelines. So obviously uh, better uh, results were associated with, correlated with, uh, family involvement. Um, Nilsen uh, found that family members that were involved in treatment had were less anxious and less depressed. Um, Kurjantakis found that family involvement, um, also found that family involvement led to better outcomes and better individual and family functioning. Uh, and also she found that she looked at the factors that facilitate family involvement. So open and effective communication to start with, family and professional support, in other words, maybe extended family support, professional support, and good coping skills going in led to more family involvement. On the other hand, the barriers to family involvement were a lot of family conflict, um, the family being isolated from supports, and uh, mental health and or substance use concerns. So in other words, healthier families are more likely to engage in treatment and benefit from treatment. Those who need help the most struggle to use it effectively at all and may not even show up. Um, so this is a real contradiction and a real difficulty that the people who are most in need are least likely to get into treatment and support the problem gambler. Um, so what Kurchentak has pointed to was a need for more integrated mental health and addiction services for families. Perhaps families need um, uh, more integration in the services they get so that it's one-stop shopping uh, and a lot of support in order for them to, uh, to stay involved and address the issues. Okay, I'm going to turn to pharmacotherapy. Um, there are some mixed results. There have been trials going back to about 2,000 of SSRIs, mood stabilizers, uh, dopaminergic medications, opioid antagonists such as naltrexone, and glutamatergic medications. Um, there are mixed results due to some early failure to differentiate uh, between one client's concurrent disorders and another's. If you if you, um, if you mix clients with quite different concurrent disorders and give them all the same medication, you're going to muddy your results. And this is one of the arguments I've had with researchers for um, a couple of decades. Um, you really need to look at what the conditions are going in. You can't just say, oh, you know, all problem gamblers. Problem gamblers are just too various to all respond to the same. Um, drugs. And the answer I used to get was, oh, well, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think they're finally getting to that a little bit. Uh, so there have been some review studies. Uh, Grant, for instance, in 2014 found 
Um, he found support for uh, opioid antagonists and glutamatergic agents, especially for those with strong urges to gamble. So here we are, we're getting to the actual client characteristics and what they might need. Um, Pedruso uh, also did a review and, and found uh, uh, and confirmed the utility of targeting glutamatergic systems, particularly to address cravings, impulsivity, and cognitive inflexibility. So this is where I think it's starting to get useful. Um, Dowling did, oh, sorry. Um, so, yes, wait, I had more to say on that one. Where am I going? Excuse me. So what, basically what I'm saying is that it's crucial to take a client's concurrent disorders into account, and the failure to do that is not going to lead to good research. Okay. So treating gambling and concurrent disorders, moving on from that. There has not been much study, but most post hoc, um, mostly what, what we've seen is post hoc analysis to look at the influence of psychiatric disorders on outcome. Uh, Dowling looked at this um, a year or two ago and, um, and found that there, wasn't, there was some efficacy of standard treatment. There was not much harm in, in offering standard treatment. So, in other words, people with concurrent disorders did benefit from um, the, the standard treatments that we offer, uh, but there wasn't anything specific to them. Um, there are only a few randomized control trials that were very specifically targeted to psychiatric subgroups, and they were, they were quite um, uh, specific. Um, there was preliminary evidence for um, modified dialectical behavior therapy for comorbid sub substance use, and so that would have been one study. Um, another study found that the addiction, uh, the addition of naltrexone to cognitive behavioral therapy uh, was useful for comorbid alcohol use problems. Uh, the addition of, uh, oh, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, and uh, cethylcysteine to tobacco support programs and imaginal desensitization, motivational interviewing for comorbid, comorbid nicotine dependence. Lithium, no, not, no surprise for comorbid bipolar disorder. Uh, Ciprolex for comorbid anxiety disorders. And the addition of CBT to standard drug treatment for comorbid schizophrenia. So um, it, these were you know, very, very focused studies and they don't tell us a lot in general. Um, but they're useful for what they're worth. My question is, um, well, first of all, sorry, uh, for concurrent mental illness, obviously there's support for disorder-appropriate medication, and that seems like a no-brainer, but if you've got an anxious problem gambler, treat, treat their anxiety. If you've got a depressed problem gambler, treat their depression, et cetera. Um, that's obviously going to help. Um, and so my question is, given that concurrent disorders are 75 or 80 percent of disordered gamblers, why is there so little study um, on this population? What, and also what barriers do specific concurrent disorders present to successful treatment, and how can these be addressed? Uh, we know that more complex patients need, clients need uh, more. What more do they need? What is helpful to them, and what keeps them in treatment? Far more research needed on that. Treatment specialized for women. So uh, this is another very understudied area. Uh, we know uh, from research on female problem gamblers, not outcome research, but a research on the population, that women are different. Women report much higher levels of depression and anxiety. Um, their uh, substance use and other behavioral addictions are higher. Their trauma history is much higher than in the general female population. Um, that's been confirmed over and over. Um, the, the clinical research uh, in general uh, indicates that women benefit from services that are aimed at their specific needs. We've known that for a long time, that women benefit from women-only groups. Women prefer women-only groups. Um, men don't prefer men only groups, but women do. Um, and uh, 
the um, uh, you know the preference is there. They're more likely to stay. They're more likely to speak up uh, in the group and feel supported. Um, the actual outcome research, however, is very limited. Um, there's a little bit here, bits here and there, but they're not they're not large studies. Uh, for instance, uh, Bert Boughton uh, combined a workbook that was designed for women, which included elements of uh, trauma treatment and emotion regulation material, um, well well based in evidence. Um, and she also, so she provided that and she also uh, worked with the clients in an online group in, uh, via video conferencing, which I thought was quite innovative. Um, and uh, so that is one way to bring that group experience to people online uh, and has a lot of value, I think. Uh, but the, 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 the amount of data was not really enough to, uh, to provide an evidence base around it. Mutual aid, as in most we gamblers and anonymous. There's very little research that supports the effectiveness of gamblers anonymous um, as a treatment in itself. Um, Schuler did a, a review in 2016 and found only three outcome studies, uh, all of which used gamblers anonymous as a control condition, and all three found significantly better outcomes in, formal, in, in the formal treatment condition as opposed to GA, um, which does not sound you know, as good for GA as it might. Um, some indications in the research in, uh, suggested that continued GA attendance was associated with better results. That wouldn't be all that surprising, and it is um, a correlational result. Um, I mean, there are strong feelings about 12-step uh, groups. Many people feel quite strongly uh, about their importance. Unfortunately, the data just doesn't really support that. Uh, client engagement in GA tends to be low, even when it's recommended by a clinician. Um, perhaps GA is more effective as an adjunct to formal treatment. Um, again, it's a question of what works for whom. We used to say that the more grandiose clients um, uh, with, with most sort of brash personalities, did best in GA, where they got a lot of confrontation and uh, uh, and they were they were pushed to to really look at things uh, more. You know, it was more confrontational, which which treatment has a tendency to be less of. Now, there's no actual data on that, but maybe that's the case. Maybe some people do better in GA than others. So. There are some real-world application issues here uh, that I want to talk about a little bit. Um, is research addressing the clients that are seen the most? And I would say no. Uh, easy to treat clients will respond to most interventions. Um, the research samples are not generally reflective of the treatment populations that we deal with. Some studies, in fact, screen out concurrent disorders uh, altogether. Uh, and so most studies are not addressing client complexity. Uh, on the other hand, the current best clinical practices are to attend to that complexity. We know that, that that is what works. That's our best practice now. So research is focusing in on a small subset uh, for the most part. It's also asking which intervention rather than which client. That really is a theme that runs through the problem gambling um, uh, uh, treatment uh, treatment research literature. It's, it's about inter which interventions work best. And I think that really might be, it, it, that might be enough. <laughs> maybe that's, uh, maybe it's time to move on to which client uh, benefits from what. Again, there's very little information on who drops out and why, and who does well or poor, poorly uh, in treatment and why. Um, and I think those are really important questions. Um, I'm going to end quicker than I thought, so I'm going to end up having lots more time for questions. Good. Um, so research finds, in summary, that CBT, uh, motivational interviewing, mindfulness, brief and online interventions, pharmacotherapy, uh, women and family-focused treatments, all have, they're, they're either well-supported or they're promising interventions for disordered gambling. Mutual aid, 
while not well supported, may have value as an adjunct. And the next areas for study, I would say, would be around complexity, um, uh, particularly concurrent disorders, the needs of subgroups, including various, uh, various types of concurrent disorders, women, cultural groups, older adults, and so on, and um, the needs of families, uh, very much so. I think these are, are the, the crucial areas where uh, we need to know more about what works. And um, this is where you'll find my article and the references. I had a few more, uh, more recent references, and I can give those to you if you like. Um, and now I can turn it over to questions. Okay, so I will um, unmute all of your microphones, and I would ask that you please mute your mic again afterwards. You'll just have control over it so that as people are, are discussing with you know that we don't have a lot of background noise. Just give me one moment to do that. And as I as I go through that, Nina, there was a comment made. Let me just make sure I have it here. By Andrew Karajanis. Did I say that right, Andrew? And he doesn't have a microphone. So he says, I have a few clients who have significant mental health obstacles to gambling treatment, but they won't seek the specialized help that I've referred them to. That's a barrier I've been trying to figure out. Is that something you can comment on as I unmute everyone else? Um, sure. I wasn't sure. Uh, does does the, uh, the the clients won't go to specialized mental health treatment, or they won't go to specialized gambling treatment? Um, I Andrew hasn't specified, but it sounds like they just won't go to the the treatments and supports that he's recommending in general, perhaps. Mm. Yeah, it's a that's a tough one, um, and I think that's a, a constant problem, particularly for people with a lot of um, mental health uh, concerns and complexity is a reluctance to go to treatment um, and uh, and seek it. And I, you know, I can think of of some of my colleagues spending month after month trying to convince people to um, to go for further treatment. It takes time uh, and a lot of work to get people to do that. So just um, as we've unmuted everyone's mic, I'd like to remind you all to please mute your mic if you don't have a question for Nina. We have a lot of background stuff going on right now. And if we can't sort that out, perhaps I will have to mute everyone and just unmute by request. It actually sounds a little better now. Does anyone else have a question? Does that, Andrew did say specifically they won't go to mental health referrals. Does that answer or provide insight for you, Andrew? He'll have to text you to find him. Yeah. Oh, he did. Yes, thanks, he says. Okay. Um, I have a question from Ashley Davidson. What is the best approach in working with impulse control disorders? Um, it's an interesting question, and I think that's a bit compli complicated. Um, if we're looking at impulse control disorders like uh, attention deficit that disorder, um, we're probably again looking at what is the right medication, for one thing, that might help them to get more control. Um, uh, just like for depression, there may be medications that are appropriate for those individuals. Um, impulse control disorder, there, you know, there are a lot of, of uh, um, studies on what, what kinds of medications work the best. There are also, I think, things that you can do uh, in terms of CBT to help people with their impulses. And one of the things that I think might be really valuable, and I haven't seen it um, discussed very much, but we know that impulsivity often leads to dropout. Uh, and, um, you know, say when somebody drops out and they come back and we ask them why, you know, you can, you can hear all the impulsive behavior in there. Um, you know, they suddenly decided to go to Vancouver instead, or they, you know, they suddenly decided that, you know, treatment would never work for them, and so they dropped out. And so I think there really is a, um, a connection between impulsivity and dropout um, that might be addressed really early if we know from our assessment that this is an impulsive individual. Uh, maybe we should be starting right off with how to address their impulses, um, you know, predicting that they may in fact end up um, uh, having such impulses and, and, and problem solving. 
about how to how to address them. So that's that's something I would have liked to experiment with, never did. Okay. Thanks, Nina. Just going to look through if anyone who has a mic has a verbal question, I'll give you some a second to ask. Um hi, it's Jane and Aston in Ottawa. Hi Jane. How are you, Nina? Good to hear your voice again. Yours too. I'm amazed you're on here. You know more than I do. <laughs> well, I like to see what's the current. <laughs> um, I have found really good results in setting up separate groups for gamblers with uh, uh, skill-based players and in the other group uh, people who play slots and VLT and uh, bingo because uh -huh. I find that they don't uh, speak the same language and mm -hmm. they don't they they tend to uh, separate from each other in group hmm. and uh, so I have two separate treatment groups and that I found that works better for a group uh, identification and unity mm -hmm. have, have mm -hmm. you any knowledge of that, why that would be? Um, no, I, I, it's not in my experience, um, uh, actually, but I think it might depend on what the focus is. Uh, I think that that sounds fascinating and you might want to, you know, get a researcher in there to, to do a study. Um, uh, it, it would be all that hard to, to um, say, compare your, your groups to, um, to a group that, that doesn't separate the two and, and see what, what some of the results are. Um, I mean, this, this is where uh, it's so important to use the, um, the knowledge of, of clinicians and, and, uh, and work with them. Um, that, that connection's great. Okay. But I haven't seen it myself. Yeah. Uh... It just, you know, uh, kind of fell out that way because I always had two treatment groups running and mm -hmm. uh, I discovered that there was a, a lot more um, tighter group dynamics. Yeah, it, it might be, it would be a great clinical paper to write. Uh, I tend to that. plant the materials a little bit differently too. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this would be a great thing for you to share. Jane, in a, you know, in a clinical paper or something of the kind. And oh, research I have no it. research to back it up. <laughs> no, but even clinical papers are, are, are worthwhile with all your experience and, and, uh, and maybe some, some clinical researcher would be, like to do that. Sounds mm -hmm. like a great idea. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. I have a question in the Q&A section. Let me just dig it up here. Um, from Laureen, one thing that I don't think has been studied is addressing finances as a part of treatment, developing budgets, restitution plans, and particularly money protection plans. Comments? Um, I didn't mention it, but I, I, I would have included it if I had uh, listed all of the different elements. You're, you're, you're quite right. Um, and that, <clears throat> in my experience, is standard practice uh, to address finances one way or another. Um, and I think it is crucial because otherwise people are still wallowing in, in terrible debt and, and with no, no resolution and no plan. So by all means, that's, you know, that is an important factor uh, in treatment. Great. Thank you. I don't have any other written questions in front of me right now. Um, is there anyone with a microphone who'd like to ask a question? Um, I do have a question. It's um, Jackie. From Park. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Nina. Um, so, just to tag off of the financial question, so I do community based work, and when we're talking about trying to make sure that clients have the varied support, so I provide counseling and case management, uh, but not as much as case management that involves all of these components, right? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, things that come up are uh, finances are always a big piece. And then also, as much as we're also doing some support around trauma, I also noticed that there's very limited resources in terms of if we're going to refer out for residential treatment, and then those residential treatments don't even address trauma either. So first the finance question, and then the question around um, 
ideas around trauma support. Right. Well, you know, in terms of what works, I'm pretty sure that what works is is as comprehensive a program and, and holistic a program as as one can manage. Um, when when um, when a gambling program is embedded within a multi-service agency with lots of resources, I'm pretty sure that the, the clients benefit. Um, when a gambling treatment uh, program is isolated and, and has few resources uh, in-house, it's, you know, it's obviously going to be more difficult. In terms of finances, I think that uh, uh, we've toyed occasionally with the idea of, of bringing um, financial counselors in to the, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, bringing somebody from Credit Canada in to work with people once a week or once every couple of weeks. Um, uh, that seems like a good idea to try. Um, and, uh, and, and in any case, working closely with whoever can manage uh, to, um, to offer that kind of help with regard to budgeting and et cetera. Um, the second question being uh, around concurrent disorders. Uh, I think that was your second question, was it? <laughs> yes, yes, around trauma. So there's oh, very few places right. where you can actually, yeah, where you can actually refer out, like yeah. in terms of re residential. And mm -hmm. you know, as far as I know, yeah. they don't offer the trauma support. And I know, I know, residential treatment isn't necessarily the end all be all. It can also be part of a beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but it surprises me that there isn't trauma informed stuff there. So that's, yeah. that's what I wanted to mention. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that, uh, I mean, Jean Tweed does, I think, and, and I, I would imagine that some others um, have, have elements here and there, but uh, you're, you're right. I've found that, that addiction treatment, uh, residential addiction treatment often does not include trauma unless it goes longer. And so maybe that would be a next step for residential treatment programs would be to, to add a second um, component for those with more complex issues, including trauma, to get deeper in and uh, and go further. But it's uh, it, you know it's also something that could be offered uh, on an outpatient basis if if we can uh, provide something in house for people with trauma, uh, long with or or after the, the the specific gambling treatment that they're getting, but under one roof. I think they're more likely to attend. Um, and it's more likely to be suited to their needs. Um, so I'm all for it. Uh, the more it is under one roof, the better, in my opinion. And Andrew mentions um, through the chat function that the, he knows of trauma-informed residential treatment for substance addiction, but not for gambling addiction specifically. Mm -hmm. And, and trauma-informed yeah. trauma -informed isn't the same thing as, as trauma-treating. Um, you know, yes, people, people are doing their best, uh, treatment programs are doing their best to be trauma-informed. That doesn't mean that they're actually addressing trauma. No. And as far as I know, so just in terms of my referrals over the years, I think, um, and I also work with senior populations, so some, some of it was addressed at Sister Mary Margaret Smith or whatever, mm -hmm. up until the day. Then there's, I don't know if anybody's on the phone from these locations, and there's uh, Windsor doesn't do trauma, and then Jean Tweed, Mm -hmm. um, still their regular, it's still their regular substance program, and then gamblers go for three separate days for gambling specific stuff, and then come back. So they're really in the substance program, and then three days of gambling. So it's still, and yes, there's some trauma related stuff there, which is great, but you know, encompassing three days to me is, is not enough for some clients. So. But those are my experiences. If anybody has any other uh, resources, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can't really treat women without treating trauma uh, in general. So very true. Uh, and, and, yeah, it's a gap. It's definitely a gap. There are a lot of gaps, and that's one of them. Um, Nina, are you willing to share your slides afterward, or we will be sharing sure. the recording of this thing? Okay, cool. So we can we can help people get their hands on those if they'd like them. Of course. Nina, Jack, again, can I ask you about the meds? You were you had didn't have them up on the slides, but you you had mentioned. And I just wanted to make sure there was nothing I missed. You'd mentioned off a couple of meds after you were talking about the. Um, the few, you know, the few studies with concurrent mental illness, but you had, you know, lithium, ciprolex, you'd named off a few. Can you name those again? Oh, sure. Hang on. Uh, 
and it's all it's all in the it's in the white paper probably in, in more detail. So if you just oh, okay. look at the white paper, it's there. Um, I think what I did was I gave I probably gave a, um, a, a, a sorry the a different version of the name, you know, uh, for for a couple of them. Now Trexone, um whew, and a cell a cellus. Steam? Oh boy, I am bad at this. Um, and uh, lithium and citalopram, which is Ciprolex. So I probably said Ciprolex instead of citalopram. Same thing. Okay, what did you say the one was? The stuff seen? Um, okay. I don't know if I heard that. And a, you, you are going to make me say something I can't say over and over, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> Is there a way maybe that we can connect you Central, with Central Cysteine. Okay, there we go. I don't I don't know enough about it. Have a look at the at the paper. Okay. And sure. uh it'll it'll uh give you the the, the um the reference. Okay. Great. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Um Melinda says, is there any book you can recommend for CBT for gamblers. Oh my goodness, there there are a number of them. Um, off the top of my head, uh, I would like to send it to the crowd. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, what what, what what have people found useful lately? I'm not seeing anything in terms of a chat on that. Some of the materials come out of they're coming out of CAMH. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, but I'm not there anymore. Um, right. Um, I, I, I'd have to get back to you on on what some of the recent ones are. Off the top of my head, I can't. Um, I can't. I can't rattle them off, but I can certainly find them for you. And for those of you um, who do have questions that will either be lingering after this conversation or come up tomorrow, or I can provide you with Nina's email address. So for these pieces like Melinda's question that she hasn't been able to answer in the moment, feel free to follow up with her for more details on that. Yeah. One, one other place to look for such resources would be um, problemgambling.ca, uh, which is the CAMH uh, website for, um, which has a ton of resources on there. And uh, they should be able to, uh, to provide you with those. Sylvia, are you there? What? No, Sylvia? Maybe Sylvia doesn't have <laughs> a microphone. Okay. <laughs> um, I also got a question from Andrew. Uh, you spoke about a book in your slides that speaks about women in gambling. Do you have the information on that book on hand, or is it referenced in your paper? It's referenced in my paper, and I'm not sure it's a book, actually. I think it was a uh, study. Are, okay. is, is he speaking about them? Because those are those are studies. Okay. Um, he 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 thought he picked up on one book, but that's possible. I'm but sure. the information would be in your paper. Oh yeah, yeah, it's in my paper. Okay. All of the references are there. And is there anyone else that has any questions for Nina? Uh, hi, it's Jane again. Hi, Jane. I just want to say that. Um, if it's at all possible to link our clients to GA, it's really good for uh, referral purposes because uh, probably 80% of my referrals come from GA. The mm -hmm. Clients who are active in GA uh, pass out my business cards and tell people to come and get some treatment. Yeah, that's if, a really good know, point. If we are experiencing low demand for gambling services, GA is an important referral resource in my experience. Yeah, I think you're right. That's an excellent point. Uh, being, um, uh, keeping connected with all of the uh, sources of support is, is crucial and that's a very big one. Any more wisdom, Jane? Because we need it. Well, just, <laughs> The family treatment piece, you know, I've always been very offended by the term collateral. Yeah, me too. That it's really depersonalizing, that they are primary clients in my mm -hmm. perspective and need to have 
the same amount of services and access to support. And they, we need to develop specific programming for families. There's mm -hmm. been very little done on that, and I would really like to see more research yeah. and best practices developed for family. And yeah. really what I've done um, is various things. I've had a, a problem gambling family support group. I did that mm -hmm. for years. Um, but uh, as my funding has eroded over the years, um, there's only so many groups I can do. And so what I've done is um, mainstream them with our regular family programming for people with uh, chemical dependence issues and um, educated the staff that works with them about <laughs> Um, orienting them to differences between gambling family and substance abuse families. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, just a more recent development and it seems to be working out really well. Yeah, you're finding that the, uh, um, that they, the, the gambling family members are, 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 are feeling well supported? Yes, well and they have access to um, better uh, long-term services mm -hmm. and intensive day treatments and uh, uh, and I can continue to support them one-on-one -on -one, so it's kind mm -hmm. of a best uh, mm -hmm. scenario where they're, they're getting individual counseling with a gambling counselor but mm -hmm. they're also involved in larger programming. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I, really I, I agree. Oh. So just being mind, I don't want to cut you guys off if there's more um, conversation around this. I just am making everyone aware of the time. We probably have time for either a little bit more discussion on this or one more question. If anyone has a burning question, we might want to. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm done. Had my say. Okay. Well, I'm just going to say that, that yes, I, I agree with you completely. And anything that helps uh, families get what get the services that they need um, is crucial. It's always hard when funding is reduced. Um, <clears throat> but, the, you know, the, the, the unit of treatment should be the family, not the individual, in my view, um, unless the individual has no family, which does sometimes happen. Yeah, but it needs to be both. Yeah, I agree. So to those of you um, who registered for this, WebEx event through our constant contact message that was sent out. I can get you Nina's information that way. Um, for those of you who like got that your hands on this WebEx through other means, I will post my email address in the chat window so that you can um, contact me and I can pass on Nina's information that way. And I will remind you that as you exit the WebEx, you will be prompted to complete a very, very brief little feedback survey, and we would really appreciate it if you would take a couple of moments to do that. Nina, do you have any final words? No, just happy to talk about gambling again for a change. Yeah. <laughs> take well, care. We yeah, we're very grateful to Nina. Thank you very much for your, writing your paper and then also for presenting it here. And thanks to all of you who um, participated in, and listened in today. I hope you have a great week. Take Thank care. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nina.